Hello everyone, it's Nathan Kang here. No. Hello everyone, it's Pastor Nathan here, and uh, we are continuing our Thursday night Bible study. Uh, today, it's actually going to be by recording as we're going through uh, the book of Esther when it comes to all the overviews of each book of the Bible and to see how it all connects with the gospel of Christ. And uh, you'll probably wonder why this is video. You're probably wondering where I'm at right now. I'm actually uh, in a hotel room next to the airport in Dallas, Texas. And uh, the conference ended Wednesday. I was originally supposed to fly out Wednesday, which is yesterday, uh, but then my flight was canceled three times. But hopefully, um, I'm able to fly out today. Originally, they scheduled for me to fly out this coming weekend on Saturday, but um, I was able to try to get a flight, the quickest flight as possible. Unfortunately, that flight is, and if you could pray for me, uh, is going to be leaving tonight here at uh, 10 o'clock um, Central Time, and which is about 8 o'clock for you guys over there, probably the time you're watching this video actually. And um, I'm going to Chicago first, and I have an eight-hour layover in Chicago. And then uh, tomorrow morning, Friday morning at 7 o'clock, I'll be flying out for Central Time from Chicago all the way to LAX, hopefully getting there about 10 o'clock um, Pacific Standard Time. So pray for me in that regard. Pray that um, it doesn't get canceled. I do need to be back, and there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. So it would be, uh, it would be it would be an answer to prayer if you could just pray that I would be able to come back and pray for me also uh, you know at the time of this recording I'm in the hotel room but I'm going to be at the airport for quite a significant time and um, you know one of my prayers is that I could be a gospel witness to somebody at the airport maybe share the gospel with somebody there at Dallas Fort Worth or uh, at O'Hare or even on the airplane so if you could just pray that somehow that I would have an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody uh, during this time and, uh, you know, there's a specific reason that God has uh, all of this happening, not only to me, but to a lot of other pastors that are at the conference with me here. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a reason behind that. And it's interesting because today, the book that we're going through is talking about the sovereignty of God. And it's the book of Esther. Before we get into it, I do want to say uh, there's a couple of prayer requests. And uh, first of all, continue to pray for Reyna's family and then Reyna's husband, Recovery, and uh, continue to pray for them. Pray for Pastor and his family as they're still in vacation in Hawaii. And uh, just pray that their flight will be okay as they return uh, this coming uh, tomorrow, actually. And uh, so tomorrow evening. And hopefully their flight doesn't get canceled. I don't think so because all the weather seems to be okay. There's a winter storm here. Um, it, if you look outside, it's still there's a lot of fleeting ice and uh, fleeting rain, and there's icy roads and all that. And uh, so I think the whole time when I was driving my rental car, it was about um, at most uh, 15 miles per hour the whole time here. Uh, but just pray for them as they travel back, and they had a good time with their extended family as well. So pray, and they really missed the church. They really wish they could be here, obviously. Uh, but obviously, or over there where you're watching it, uh, watching this video from. Uh, but uh, pray for them, and we're excited to have Pastor and his family back. And then pray for various other uh, requests here that were mentioned throughout. Uh, many of you know, uh, pray for Krista, uh, for her uh, request about her, uh, you know, her checkups when it comes to uh, what she mentioned last Thursday. And then also pray for the Perez's as they're traveling right now in the Philippines. And then also for the Cortez family as they're traveling. And so for many other families as they're traveling as well. So just pray for them. And uh, so I wish we could be in person. I really wanted to be there in person and spend time with a lot of our Bible study group that come out on Thursday. But unfortunately, things happen, but that's okay. God's in control, and that's what we'll be talking about tonight. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into the overview of the book of Esther. Father in heaven, thank you once again for this day. And Lord, we know that you're in control, and we trust in you in everything that you do. And Lord, help us to... Uh, not be anxious, help us to put aside every distraction, and help us just to focus on uh, your amazing grace and your sovereignty, Lord, especially as we go through the book of Esther. I pray that you just be with this time of Bible study uh, this evening, Lord. We thank you once again and be with all the shared requests as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The book of Esther is written about its main character, which is Esther. You, you probably guessed it. Um, the author is not Esther, but many scholars 
scholars uh, uh, speculate that it was either Ezra or Nehemiah given its close association with those books. The events in this book likely took place after the Jewish exiles returned to Jerusalem covering a 10-year period uh, between 483 to 473 BC. It is likely, according to scholars, to be written uh, between Ezra chapter 6 and Ezra chapter 7. If these dates that they assume that this book was written within are indeed accurate. The events likely took place during the reign of King Ahasuerus, also known to the West, many in the West, throughout Western history as Xerxes, who is the son of Darius I and the father of Artaxerxes, which is the king who sent Nehemiah uh, uh, back to Jerusalem, if you remember, as we were going through the book of Nehemiah last, uh, last week. In the overview of this book, we're taking a look at the ancient Persian Empire, a point of view from a Persian Jew where we see a cross between a fairy tale and a mystery story. Brave and beautiful Esther is the fair maiden who becomes the queen of the kingdom of Persia. Villain Haman launches an attack to destroy her and her people. The hero Mordecai helps Esther thwart the evil plan, risking her life, then saving her people. Kind of just gave you a spoiler as to what we're just about to uh, go into. It's a story that includes three important truths about God, even when God is never mentioned throughout the entire book. John Nelson Darby said this, God's way are behind the scenes, but he moves all the scenes which, is, which he is behind. And God's work in the gospel isn't always obvious, visible, or even audible. Yet we see throughout this entire book God's providential presence, preserving his people, moving in different ways through ordinary events, showing them how they string them together in such a way that God's will is ultimately done and shown. And so first of all, if you're taking notes, I wanted to take a first heading note here, uh, which is supernatural providence. Chapter one to two is super, we see God's supernatural providence. In this period, Israel had forgotten about God during their time of their exile and the events that occurred within the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Yet while Israel might have forgotten about them, God did not. The book of Esther shows God's ongoing providence under the least likely circumstances and in culture unsympathetic to Jewish interests. Here in this book, book of Esther specifically, we see it begin with Israel's exile and captivity. As we have mentioned the past two weeks, the Babylonians had already conquered Judah, but they had been conquered in return by the Persians. So Judah was conquered by the Babylonians, the Babylonian Empire was conquered by who? The Persians. The king Ahasuerus threw a large party and invited all of Persian nobility and the upper class to it, and the reason behind it really was political. It was politics, purely politics. In displaying his own wealth and costly possessions, the king was attempting to lobby and sell these wealthy upper class nobles on a war plan. They were needing to expand their kingdom. They wanted to uh, exert more of their power and expand it. But before he did though, he needed money, he needed support. So he was planning to throw this dinner party to kind of lobby them, kind of butter them up, try to get them to uh, be a part of this and be on the same page as this. The lobbying was necessary because of the new threat that was rising on the West under Philip II of Macedon, who was the later the father of who we might consider uh, or know as uh, Alexander, Alexander. And so they had their first dinner party, which lasted <laughs> six months, not just one day, six months. This was a long dinner party, a uh, feast. Wow, I mean, that's a long time uh, for half the year. When the first party ended, the king wanted to host a second smaller feast and a party which lasted only seven days compared to six months. Now that was specifically to give thanks to the palace officials and the team for their assistance in their first party. Well, that's kind of a nice thing for the king to do, to throw a party for his, uh, whoever set up the party for six months, especially. King Ahasuerus' wife, however, uh, King Vashti, um, threw her own party for the woman. Uh, which was a standard protocol within that cultural era. So the men would have their party, and then the woman under the queen, Vashti at the time, would have um, their own uh, party as well. And so within the supernatural providence, as you're taking notes, I want to notice here, first of all, the dismissal of a queen. The dismissal of a queen, okay? So the six days of the party goes by, and the seven days comes along. King Ahasuerus sent one of his servants or advisors to get Queen Vashti, to the queen, to come out. 
Now remember here, by the time of this party, King Ahasuerus, like many times he was, he was already drunk, and uh, he called upon a service to call his wife, his, the queen consort, to come out. Really try to parade her off, to show her off as like a trophy. Uh, this is my wife. This is the queen. I want to show her off. Yet, this is an interesting thing that happens. Vashti refuses to come. Now, no one really knows the main reason as to whatever it, what, why that was. But whatever it was, Vashti was willing to risk the king's wrath, especially of a king known to be pretty hot-tempered. I mean, King Ahasuerus uh, was an interesting man. I mean, um, there was a storm that formed over this body of water between Turkey and Europe. Um, and it was called the Hellespont. And uh, within that storm that came through that uh, body of water, uh, what he did, what happened was it destroyed a bridge that he had built. What did King Ahasuerus respond with? This is how petty and pretty hot-tempered this guy was. He goes to the sea, he goes to the Hellespont, this body of water, and starts grabbing a whip and starts whipping the water to stop the storm. I mean, this is who, I mean, if this was your leader or president or king, and uh, he had that kind of temper, I mean, you know, for Vashti to risk that, that's a pretty big deal. So Vashti did not want to come out, and she was risking the king's wrath. Yet while he was mad, um, King Ahasuerus didn't quite understand what he was facing. He was shocked. I mean, I never faced, especially in that time of uh, period, um, opposition, not let alone from your own wife. Um, and he was shocked as many were. I mean, the king never had anyone say no to him, really. So he asked some of the princes and they gave him some advice. He said, if the king's wife is doing that, um, well, the noble woman all over the kingdom, uh, over the empire throughout various provinces of the 127 provinces that is under your control, king, um, you know, they're going to do that against their noble husband. They're going to do it against um, their noble husband who's part of the king's officials here. So we cannot set that precedent. And so King Ahasuerus, thinking about the possibility of this, what kind of standard this may uh, lay out, sends out an edict and squashes any attempt. He squashes any attempt of, I guess, feminism taking place throughout the empire. And the queen, Vashti, was placed under house arrest. And so we see the dismissal of a queen. Secondly here, I want to notice here the designation of a queen, a new queen. There's a gap between chapter 1 and 2 is when king, the king probably goes against the Greeks in multiple battles, including the famous battle against the Greeks in Thermopylae. Okay, you might have, you've probably heard of that battle in Thermopylae, and the Persians won that battle, but at a very high cost. They lost about 20,000 of their finest soldiers, their frontline soldiers were killed, whereas the Greeks suffered the, only the loss of about 1,000 soldiers. Most of them were Spartans. Uh, you probably remember the 300 uh, Spartans uh, that took a uh, last stand in this battle of Thermopylae against the Greeks, uh, I'm sorry, against the Persians here. After this victory, unfortunately, the, uh, the Persians would also not only win this victory at such a high cost, but they would lose the next battle against the Greeks at Plataea. King Ahasuerus comes back home. He's depressed not only from a difficult victory, but also an embarrassing loss. He also becomes very lonely because when he came home, he had nobody come to you. I mean, you put away your wife. <laughs> but in Esther chapter 2, verse 1, it says here, After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and was decreed against her. Um, now you remember. Okay? Now you made a decision because of your emotional needs and uh, now you regret it. Yet even despite how he felt emotionally, he knew he couldn't go back on his royal decree. When you issue a decree at that period, you cannot go back to it. You can't. You have probably have to issue a new decree to overcome that previous decree. It's amazing how people need to face the consequences uh, for their decisions. He made a decision based on emotions. And because of that, he's facing the consequences of it. That's a great reminder for us. You make a decision based on your emotions, um, well, you need to face the consequences for your decisions as well. In order to fulfill his loneliness, his valet would come up with an idea. Well, king, let's find you a new queen by having some form of contest. Well, that's interesting. The king liked the idea and gathered commissioners to host this contest in various providence to gather the most beautiful woman to be his next wife. 
It, did, it didn't take long for the king to choose a winner for the beauty contest. A Jew whose ancestors were captured by the Babylonians, when Jerusalem fell, would bring his niece, who is raised after her parents' death. The Jewish man's name is Mordecai, and his, na uh, his niece's name is Hadassah, known by the Persian, her Persian name, Esther. The king really liked Esther immediately from the start. It was like, for him at least, love at first sight. I mean, he expedited her beauty treatment and the selection. After the selection, the king, uh, the king celebrated with another big festival. I mean, he was just amazed, by, astonished, and uh, you know, mesmerized by her beauty, and just immediately uh, grabbed a hold of her as the next queen. But there was a major issue with this uh, marriage. No one in the palace, the king included, knew that Esther was in fact a Jew. In fact, she's not supposed to be married into a union with a pagan individual. That's on Esther's part. But more importantly, uh, you know, nobody, nobody knew that she was a Jew. Her uncle Mordecai told her to keep her heritage a secret. Later, we see Mordecai as one individual uh, serving on the king's team. Mordecai was uh, her uncle and he was serving on the king's team, probably because of the connection here with Esther. And Mordecai was an honorable man. Uh, as we see later, uh, he was a very honorable man, and he really kept his responsibilities dear to his heart. Even when he heard there was an assassination attempt on the king's life, he told Esther, who then told King Ahasuerus, who made an inquiry leading to two conspirators being arrested, then eventually executed. So this was the type of person Mordecai was. He was a loyal and uh, he was an honest man of integrity. So we see here the supernatural uh, providence here uh, in the first two chapters. But then as we go into chapter 3 to 5, I want to notice here the satanic plotting. The satanic plotting. So now we have three characters in this book mentioned already. Uh, Ahasuerus, Esther, and Mordecai. King Ahasuerus, Queen Esther, and the uncle and the king's official Mordecai. Now it is time to view who the bad guy is. The villain. The evil guy in this story, if I could say. Esther chapter 3, verse 1, it says, After these things did uh, King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamathatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. I want you to introduce you to Haman, a man that the king appoints and commands all to bow down before. Yet Mordecai, he does not. He does not bow down to Haman. Immediately from the start after seeing this, Haman who is, by the way, very egotistical, as we see later, and narcissistic, if I could use that word for this sake of illustration here, Haman is very displeased. He hated Mordecai from the very start. He found out that he was a Jew, and that even uh, made him more vengeful and more uh, uh, um, evil against towards uh, Mordecai. He didn't just want to get rid of Mordecai at this point. He wanted, He was so upset by Mordecai. He was so jealous of Mordecai. He was so he so hated Mordecai that he wanted to not only get rid of Mordecai, but he also wanted to destroy all the Jews at that kingdom. Esther chapter three verse six it says, and he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed his people the uh, of Mordecai, where, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. Man, that is, wow! Just because he didn't bow down to you. <laughs> I mean, if you thought King Ahasuerus overreacted, take a look at this guy. I mean, take a look at how he's overreacting because one guy would not kiss up to him. Um, Haman goes to the uh, king and got him to write another edict or a decree. This time the decree would punish the people in the kingdom whom Haman did not name but accused of having different laws and disobeying king, the king's laws. Uh, I mean, it's kind of obvious who that is at this point. Uh, Haman even offered to pay a large reward to have all of these types of people killed. Okay, Throughout the, all the provinces that this edict goes out, if you find somebody that have a different type of laws or cultural laws and do not obey the king's laws, then have them killed. You kind of know who it's aiming towards. I mean, it's kind of not said because whatever reason, they can't name it, but then everyone knows who they were talking about. The king not only agreed, but also gave Haman his signet ring, which at that period of time means the king approves it and to carry out the extermination plan. Haman was manipulative. I mean, he, he knew how to manipulate the king in order to get this. I mean, the king was probably not aware of all this. He was already busy with so many things, probably mesmerized by the beauty of Esther. And so Haman took advantage of whatever it was, and uh, he manipulated the king to sign this by getting his signet ring, which is a ring you put on and you would stamp it upon uh, you know, an envelope or um, 
a rolled up uh, paper and then you would, it would signify that anything that this is is from the king's office. So Haman becomes anti-Semitic, I guess, in that period, essentially because of one man's decision not to bow down to another human being. Mordecai heard about this new decree and he was viscerally react, he viscerally was upset and reacted by tearing his clothes, putting on a sackcloth in the morning and crying out loud. Uh, especially in the Eastern culture, this was very common. Uh, I think about in my culture as a Korean, uh, when there's great mourning, a lot of people, especially in a funeral, not today, but in the uh, older generation, especially in uh, previous uh, um, cultural history in Korea, uh, you would put a sackcloth when you're mourning somebody or in great distress. Um, so uh, I'm kind of aware as to what this is. If you're from an Asian background, you kind of know this as well. When they put on a sackcloth, it's uh, usually to signify a significant distress or mourning um, for something that happened. Uh, in our in Asian culture, most of the time, that's usually in a funeral. When he, stepped coming, when he stopped coming to the palace, Esther got worried, so he sent out a servant named uh, Hathak uh, to seek him out and to see what happened. So he sends out, she sends out a servant because, like, my uncle's not coming. This is where he worked, but he's not coming. Uh, so he sends out a, so she sends out a servant to seek him out. The servant finds Mordecai to find, and finds out what happened and uh, why Mordecai was upset. And Mordecai replied and asked that Esther would implore to the king to change it. Uh, so the, uh, her uncle really wanted uh, Esther to step in here. Esther was very hesitant. And the reason why she was hesitant is she, would, she was well aware of two things. Number one, um, she was aware of Queen, uh, uh, King Ahasuerus' temper. I mean, remember the previous wife, what happened? Remember the body of water that he uh, whipped? Uh, but he was, she was also aware that if her identity was revealed, uh, what consequences may come about from that. And she was very, she was very discerning and thinking ahead. Uh, you know, for, uh, she was concerned about it, and that's okay. And Mordecai reminded her, however, of her roots, saying that her being queen would not save her from the same fate as all the rest of the Jews. Um, saying, remember, hey, remember Queen Vashti? Uh, I don't think you just being queen will save you anyway. Esther chapter 4 verse 14 says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, there shall be enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Mordecai was explaining something important to Esther. And despite the negativity that Mordecai first gives about what's going to happen to all the Jews and to her, he also gives encouragement. He says that perhaps there's a reason you came. He says in the end of that verse, he says, there's a reason you came to this kingdom for such a time like this. In other words, maybe God placed you and made you queen so that she could be in a position to save her people and to stop Haman's evil plan. And Esther really had taken that plea to the heart, her heart and she responded with strong conviction that she will go and speak with the king. So that really persuaded her. Uh, this is my root. This is my heritage. And these are my people. And... Uh, and also the fact that God placed me here for a reason. Think about this storm. I don't know why I'm here. And for other pastors here, including the two pastors that I'm staying at this hotel with, uh, we don't know why we're here, but there is a reason behind it. And who knows what it is? Uh, who knows what that reason is? Uh, but we know that God's in control. Uh, and likewise, within your life, whatever situation you're facing, during that moment, you may not know as to what's going on, but be encouraged and be re remember this, that God's in control and there's a specific reason that God has you there. So uh, don't ever doubt God's uh, you know, uh, presence there. Don't ever do doubt God's control and sovereignty. It, it's going to be hard. There's no doubt about it. Whatever you're facing, it will be difficult. That is 100% true. And don't let somebody tell you that what you're going through is nothing. To God, God grieves with you. God understands what you're going through. God wants to comfort you. God wants to be there for you. Uh, but, you know, obviously remember this, that God's in control. And when you look unto Jesus, when you look unto God, He's able to help you overcome that trial. You will be able to overcome that difficulty, my friend, when you look unto God. Because remember that God's in control. That trial is there for a reason. Don't ever forget that. God is there for you. God's amazing grace is there always for you. He has never and He will never, never leave you. And so we see here God's sovereignty displayed here. God, you know, Mordecai reminding Esther, God's there. God has you there for a specific reason. Don't ever forget that. 
Now it was Persian law and custom that one does not simply go to a king. Okay, Esther was about to go to the king, but it's not as easy as you think. You can't just go up to the king and be like, hey bro, uh, so I need to talk to you. You can't just do that, okay? In Persian law and custom, you cannot just go visit the king on the him, whim. You have to be invited. If you did so and you were not invited, you were at the mercy of the king's scepter. So he had a scepter here. Uh, if he held it up like this, you can approach the king. The king allowed you. If you did not, you were simply taken out and executed, uh, beheaded, whatever it may be. And that's how severe it was. While Esther did not see the king for a month, uh, she knew too much was on the line. It was there was not enough time. She had to go see the king. She was not invited. Okay, the king and the queen lived separately here, uh, as many Eastern cultures did uh, uh, at that period of time. Uh, if she said nothing and was found out to be a Jew, she would be executed. If she approached the king, but the king, the king did not raise his scepter, she would be executed. So for Esther, at this point, she just decided, okay, well, I'm going to be dead either way when this goes out. So worst case scenario. Uh, but once again, uh, you know, I'm going to make a decision just to go and see and just trust in God. And we see God moving the pieces towards position on his chessboard here. Esther then goes to the king and finds favor with him. Thankfully, Esther chapter 5, 2, it says, And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. He holds the scepter, which means she could approach him. That's good, okay? She was invited to, even though she was uninvited, uh, she was able to ask what she wanted. The king was like, name what you want, honey. Name what you want. And then whatever you want, I will grant it for you. You want to have the kingdom? Sure, no problem. Anything for you. Instead, Esther simply asked for a dinner party. Just him, her, and Haman. She found what Ahasuerus really liked. A good time with her and also just within company, not alone. And a good dinner party. He loved parties. The king sent a servant to go tell Haman, and, to, uh, and together they went to Esther's dinner party. During that dinner party, the king offered to Esther, Hey, hey, honey, uh, um, you know, how are you? I, want you? I know this is a dinner party, but what do you really want? Do you want, a, you want half a kingdom? Do you want all the riches? And uh, Esther simply responds, Oh, I just want another dinner party with you, Haman, and me. And that's what Esther says the second time. I want a second dinner party. The following day, Haman was walking around feeling good about himself. And, uh, you know, I love reading this part, by the way, in scripture, because it's just funny uh, to uh, kind of imagine some portion, some books in the Bible. You could just imagine what's going on as you're reading through it. And this is one of those books. As you're reading this, it's like Haman's just walking around feeling good about himself. He, and he was joyful and uh, with himself and glad heart. Then while he was walking, he saw Mordecai, he sees Mordecai, and he's not happy. Like his mood just changes immediately. It's like, oh, okay, I don't like, I'm not happy. Like my di now my good day is now ruined. Full of hatred against him, full of indignation, he was annoyed by the presence of Mordecai. And Haman, however, controls himself, restrains himself. Okay, the decree's gonna go out. He's gonna be gone. And he invites all his family, his wife, and his friends to his house, and just brags about how. Hey guys, you know, guess what? Uh, I was the only one to be invited to the king and Esther's dinner party. Ha 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 ha. Yeah, he was like bragging about that. I mean, this is how egotistical this guy is. Then he was venting to them about how much he was annoyed with Mordecai. But there's a the thing, guys. I hate this one guy in the king's palace. He's so annoying. His name's Mordecai. His wife is supportive throughout this whole time. Yet she gives an advice to, that's quite bizarre for any advice to be given by any any person. In Esther chapter 5, verse 14, it says, His wife and all his friends unto him says, Let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. He made a gallow to hang Mordecai from it. Have a nice time for me your dinner. I mean, that's the advice that was given to him by his wife and his friends. I mean, wow, the supportive partner in this marriage is a satanic partner to a satanic husband for sure to give a suggestion like that. And Haman had those gallows made. Now, some scholars would debate as to what those gallows, uh, gallows were uh, because some translations of Hebrews will refer to the gallow as a stake. 
so it may imply it was either hanging or the impaling of a victim, which is a form of crucifixion. And if you study European history, uh, you might have heard of Vlad Dracula, who was uh, the leader of Wallachia, which is modern-day Romania, who was actually known for this form of execution, impaling uh, during the 1400s, especially as he was in war against the Ottoman Empire. So this was a very common execution method, um, and it may have implied that the gallows were actually a stake where you would be impaled on not being hanged up from. So uh, that's debated, and it's not really an important point here, but I just want to throw that out to kind of uh, help us to get history into perspective here as to what's going on. And so we see the satanic plotting here uh, in chapters 3 to 5. But I want you to notice here, uh, despite evil being planned, God was still in control. And notice here the last part, which is uh, sovereign protection. In your notes here, sovereign protection is from chapter 6 to uh, chapter 10. Even though the satanic plot was being planned, even though God is not mentioned in the book of Esther, it is quite clear and obvious that God was still orchestrating matters providentially. The night of Esther's first banquet, the king had insomnia. He could not sleep. He did everything to fall asleep. Um, he had his servants read the kingdom's records, legal briefs, court records, board minutes, whatever it may be. And the servants read all of these. And they came to a point, they were reading the history of everything that happened in the king's reign. And they read an account here of Mordecai saving the life of the king. Remember when I mentioned about the assassination plot that Mordecai prevented and thwarted in the beginning of this lesson? Uh, that was brought upon again. Now the king recalled them and asked if any honor was given unto Mordecai. The advisor said, no, nothing was ever done to honor Mordecai. And the king says, what? Okay, we need to honor this man. So he called his officials to his court, which included Haman, who was already on the way to the king to what? Ask permission to what? execute uh, Mordecai. Remember, that's what uh, that's what he was about to do because he was suggested to the, by a satanic uh, family. <laughs> so um, he was already on his way and the king called upon all the king's officials to come to the court. And the king asked Haman what he thought the king to, uh, should do to honor somebody. Now the king didn't mention Mordecai by name. He only theoretically mentioned a person that the king wanted to recognize. He says, uh, I want to recognize this honorable person for what he did for me, uh, my, my, uh, my uh, um, reign here. And <laughs> Haman, again, egotistical, thought it was about him. He says, oh, I'm the one that got invited to the dinner party. He's clearly talking about me. And, uh, you know, so that's what Haman thought. He thought that the king was referring to him. So Haman, because he thought it was him, comes up with this elaborate plan and idea. Says, you need a huge parade. You need to dress in the royal, uh, best royal robe. You need to put him on the best horse. You need to be led around. You need to have him led around by the princess. A beautiful festival and so many different ideas to try to get him uh, pumped up and excited. And the king really, really was excited by this, uh, by the Haman's suggestions, and really liked the idea and says, I love it, Haman. That's a great idea. You, you know, that's, that's something we ought to do for somebody we need to recognize here for what he did for the kingdom. I like it, Haman. Now do all of that for Mordecai. <laughs> so I can't imagine Haman's face at this point. I mean, it must have been a sight to see. Just as if Haman's day couldn't get worse, he showed up to the second dinner party uh, to, uh, with uh, the king and Esther. And um, the king asked Esther again, Honey, anything that you want. You want half the kingdom? I'll, I'll get that for you. And up to this point still, the king and Haman did not know that Esther was a Jew. Uh, yet it was here that Esther, as we talked about, was about to uh, drop the truth bomb. It was here that Esther asked for her life and the life of her people, the Jews. Esther chapter 7 verse 4, it says, For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we have been sold for bond men and bond women, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. And the king immediately, with great anger, asked who the scoundrel is behind this evil plot to kill her and her people. And Esther responded simply by saying, It is the wicked, evil man, Haman, pointing to the dinner party, second dinner party, to the only other person in the room. What an awkward dinner. Um, God had moved all his pieces on the chessboard, and even though a satanic plotting occurred, God moved his queen into the place on the board, and it was at this point checkmate. Haman begged for his life, while the king, during that moment, stormed out with great anger from that dinner party to process what just happened. 
just as if it couldn't get worse. It was already a terrible day for Haman. I mean, Haman had to plan this uh, elaborate um, uh, parade for Mordecai, and then Haman just had this truth bomb just dropped that he was the evil one planning to kill all the Jews and uh, the king's wife, Esther. Just as if that couldn't get any worse, the king comes back as Haman is begging for his life. But the thing is, Haman was begging for his life on, I guess, sprawled out a gun across the bed or the couch that the queen was uh, sitting on. And so, if, imagine this as a husband of the queen coming back and you see another man in the bed or the couch here. And it was like one of those weird moments you see the guy that you're already angry at for something he shouldn't have done. And uh, it couldn't get worse, but it did. And he sees Haman lying on the bed here. So what are you doing? Like, is this guy trying to force himself onto my wife? I mean, that's what the scripture says here. And he had immediately uh, Haman taken and arrested and took him away. And the, king's, and the king was wondering, man, this guy is insane. What am I supposed to do with this? What is the punishment that I could uh, uh, issue for this man? And as he was thinking that, uh, his servant says, um, Hey, king, uh, so there's a gallows made here originally by Haman. He made it for Mordecai. Just wanted to let you know. And the king's rat was pleased immediately, and they brought Haman to be executed, hanged, or impaled on the gallows that was made for Haman, uh, 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 made for Mordecai, who Haman uh, was jealous about. So Haman met his end at that point. What a sad end, but... I guess, uh, a punishment for an emotionally egotistical, narcissistic man um, who, uh, who, who met his uh, fate at this point. But even though the villain was off and the villain was gone, there was still one problem. The decree, okay? Haman issued that decree uh, by the king, signed by the king. That was already on its way to the 127 provinces, okay? Everyone in those provinces were not aware of what just happened here, okay? They, they, I mean, they didn't have Instagram or Telegraph or anything. It was, it was, you know, they were already on their way out. And they were under the authority to kill anybody who everybody knew were the Jews. Uh, so they were under the authority to kill all the Jews if they found, uh, uh, found out on that certain day expecting to be paid a ransom for it. For anyone that had a different law or custom, they were supposed to kill. And so that was the Jews. So that decree was going out. Esther begged again for the king to undo what evil Haman had done. Oh, Haman, this guy, you know, this guy is a problematic headache for the king and Esther. But uh, his decree went out and Esther really begged the king again. The king, what does he do? He raises the scepter again. I mean, the king really loved Esther at this point. I mean, uh, he raised the scepter again. And, uh, and he gave his signet ring that was given to uh, Haman first. He gives that signet ring to show the king's approval to Mordecai, her uncle, Mordecai. And it pretty much says this. It says, okay, you write the decree, you write the edict, and seal it. Whatever, Just write whatever you want to write and seal it with this ring. And Mordecai writes it, and the king signs it with that uh, uh, signet. Mordecai gets the decree written and the scribes immediately has it all copied and sent out to couriers on the fastest uh, horses of the king, getting the message out and they averted a genocide from taking place. Jews everywhere had a huge feast and many even converted uh, to their faith. Mordecai was placed in Haman's post, wielding a level of power and authority second only to the king. All the officials, even those that worked under Haman, feared him, turned on the Jews' enemies and eliminated 500 men, even in the capital of Shushan, including 10 of the sons of Haman. It was pretty intense, and the Jews were even given permission to defend themselves against those that wanted them dead. With Esther's approval, Mordecai made an official holiday uh, to the Jews, known as the Feast of Purim, observed at this time each year. Uh, Esther chapter verse 9, and verse 22, it says, As the days when the Jews rested from their enemies... Uh, and the month which was turned from them from sorrow to joy and from mourning into the good day, they make, uh, they should make them days of feasting and joy and of sending portions one to another and the gifts to the poor. Even at this point in their history, God exiled the Jews to a foreign land and they weren't seeking him, yet God still protected them and delivered them from their enemies. God kept this promise to extend the life of the nation which through the Messiah would come. And no matter how Satan arranges his plan and pieces, God is always in control. This book is a great reminder to each and every one of us, the power of the gospel. God is in control no matter what kind of dart Satan is throwing at you. 
Remember this wonderful truth here in the story of Esther as you go on with the rest of your week. Remember that no matter what Satan is planning or scheming, God's in control. Trust in the Lord and, and with all thy heart, with all thy spirit, and you know, trust in Him, and He's going to direct your paths. And uh, lean unto God, and He will show you. So don't ever doubt God's presence. Don't ever doubt God's control, and know that. And then I want to encourage you to encourage one another, uh, to or encourage your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Encourage me, encourage others. Um, remember, God's in control. Uh, let's move forward by faith uh, in the gospel. Well, that's the book of Esther. And uh, as we go into the next book next week, um, hopefully it's not going to be on video. Hopefully we'll be in person at Pastor's house. So I hope you have a wonderful week. Continue to be in prayer for me and Pastor and his family as we all travel back. Continue to pray for those that others are traveling. Continue to pray for so many sick in the church and so many going through difficulties. You should have received a prayer list via email. If you did not, you could uh, send me a text and uh, we could put you on that newsletter. Uh, pray for this Sunday. We have an exciting Sunday coming up. There's a lot of things happening. Uh, uh, different. It's going to be kind of different. Uh, so pray for this Sunday. I hope that you're having a wonderful week and if you're able to help us with set up tomorrow night at 6 p.m. at Vandermolen, I do want to encourage you to help us for about an hour. Uh, that will be a great blessing. Thank you once again to everyone watching. Uh, thank you church family. Uh, we, we, I'm so thankful for each and every one of you. Uh, and uh, so I pray that everything that God will continue to bless your weekend here and we will see you this coming Sunday. God bless.